Internet Explorer, Google Chrome, Firefox. It is easy to forget that these modern browsers descended from the war between Microsoft and Netscape. Eric Sink was one of the original developers of Spyglass, a browser that was licensed to both Microsoft and Netscape. If you want to understand why this happened, a browser licensing to both Microsoft and Netscape, and what the inside story of the browser wars is, and what the business of selling browser licenses in 1992 was like, stay tuned and we will get to this story after a quick message from the sponsors that make this show possible. I love being a software engineer because of how easy it is to build side projects, and I've built countless side projects. I've built a social gambling application, a dating website backend that had zero users, a stock trading music rhythm application for Android, and I think every developer should have side projects. So when I have a web app that I want to deploy and share, I want to show my friends my most recent project that nobody will care about, I use DigitalOcean to quickly spin up a server and host my projects. And who knows, if one day one of my apps takes off and goes viral and people actually do care, I can easily scale using DigitalOcean's flexible pricing plan. Companies like TaskRabbit that have grown rapidly have used DigitalOcean for this very reason. But until this happens, I will happily stick with the $5 a month plan. Sign up with promo code SEDAILY to get a free $10 credit as a listener of our show and start building your apps. We would love to see what listeners build, so send us an email showing us your project. I've also interviewed Moisey Oretsky, who is the co-founder of DigitalOcean, and he mentioned that the ease of use and the flexibility is why they built the service in the first place. That DigitalOcean in- interview is one of my favorite episodes. Moisey talks about bleeding in a data center. He says, you don't know how hard it is to do a cloud hosting service un- until you've bled in a data center. It's really interesting. So speaking of which, let's get on with this episode of Software Engineering Daily. Eric Sink is a software developer and blogger. Eric, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you. Appreciate being here. You were a key player in the browser wars back in the 90s, and you were part of the team that built the browser that got licensed or became Internet Explorer. This story starts with you joining a company called Spyglass in 1992. What was going on in your life when you joined Spyglass? <laughs> uh, that was, wow, that was a long time ago. Um, I I was, uh, well, I, I was a lot younger, I'll just say that. Um, I was working for a government research lab, and uh, I was not unhappy with my job, but this opportunity came up. It looked kind of intriguing. And at the time, Spyglass was not doing browsers. They were uh, focused on data visualization tools. And uh, they thought of their, you know, their business model as commercializing things that came out of the University of Illinois. Uh, so anyway, uh, a friend encouraged me to kind of cast a line in that water and just see what happened. I uh, ended up getting the job and uh, enjoyed enjoyed working on data visualization tools for as long as that mm. lasted. Um, that was the job I thought I was signing up for, and I, I was happy enough with it at the time. It's an interesting business model to define your company as as commercializing stuff that comes out of academia. Does that does that still happen? Are there still companies that are built in that model? Oh, certainly that still happens. the The world has changed quite a bit. The universities are generally trying to get uh, a bigger share of the pie. Um, you know, things like patents have come into play. I mean, back when we did it. And I may have overstated it when I said Spyglass defined its business that way, but nonetheless, that's, <laughs> that's what they were doing at the time. And it uh, it certainly has changed a lot. I mean, this whole uh, universities have entire offices for what they now call tech transfer, and they they have licensing departments, and they have resources to spawn startups and resources to get a revenue stream off of the technology they license and things like that. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's become a really big deal and, uh, and not a deal that I've 
had a terrible amount of interest in playing in since. Uh, but mm. that, that was the way my career started, was working for a company like that. Give me some perspective on the general world of software engineering circa 1992. 1992. Um, it was... Boy, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. The uh, things were more raw. Uh, certainly. I mean, you're talking about a world where 32-bit Windows wasn't there yet. Uh, I was at the time uh, very much a Mac or Unix guy. Um, and uh, and that, in those days, those were different. Mac was not Unix <laughs> like it is today. So uh, I, did, I had done no Windows programming uh, because I stayed out of Windows until the 16-bit world was over. Um, I was kind of a Mac fan, but that was Mac OS 9 um, or, or earlier. And back to 92, it was probably more like Mac OS 6. And, uh, though, you know, the languages of the day were C. Um, C++ was nothing like what it is today. Uh, it, was, uh, it was relatively new. I mean, it's not like it didn't exist, but it was relatively new. Um, things like... So, uh Go ahead. I was going to say, around this time, like how dominant was Microsoft and what was the framing of Microsoft versus Apple or versus IBM or whatever? I mean, this is before my time, so I'm totally unaware of what the competition space looked like. Microsoft was nothing like it was it uh, is today. They were just starting to win. And certainly nobody thought of them as the dominant player uh, like people did 10 years later. Uh, that was the era when, um, well, let's see. I mean, you're talking about Windows 3.1 was, uh, was there. And so you would think of Microsoft in that day as the company who just was wrapping up defeating Lotus 1, 2, 3. And, mm. and they were just kind of wrapping up the defeat of OS 2 from IBM. And Apple on the desktop was totally a credible player. Right. Okay. So, so around this time, you joined Spyglass. Spyglass, originally, you thought you were just going to be building scientific data analysis tools. Uh, when did Spyglass decide to shift to building web browsers? That happened in 94. And it, it, was, a, it was a combination of two factors. Uh, one was that Spyglass was uh, VC-funded. And in fact, it, it was something you don't see anymore, which was which is that it was top tier VC money um, here in Champaign, Illinois, uh, which is a town of a hundred thousand. I mean, you are not going to see uh, Sand Hill Road VCs or or Greylock investing in uh, companies that are not next to a major airport anymore. But that was you know that was the, the world of the day. And anyway, those VCs were, um, shall I say, starting to wonder where their exit was. Ah. The data tools were a fine little business and would have been a completely successful business if they didn't have to pay back uh, venture capitalists. Mm. And I think, I mean, I wasn't one of the principals, but I think they were starting to realize that. And so they did what is now called a pivot. <laughs> and they they noticed this up and coming thing um, called the web. And they noticed that the, uh, the Mosaic browser was written at uh, NCSA, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, which is right here in town. And they said, well, we licensed the data tools from NCSA. Maybe they would license us the browser. Ah, uh, so what was going on in the space of browsers uh, more broadly around this time? Uh, almost nothing. There was, uh, I mean, this was really early. There was the uh, the original browser from uh, Tim Berners-Lee's team in, in Switzerland. Um, and there was Mosaic. And Mosaic was basically some students at U of I sat down with this idea of the web and said, you know, this would be really cool if we added a, a couple more things like images and forms. That would be awesome. And so they did that, and it, it sort of opened a lot of people's eyes to this idea that hypertext could be more than just text. It could be 
it, it, you know, we, this is well before later when we th started thinking of it as a platform for apps. This is just, wow, could we have images and could we submit data? Could we have forms? And uh, I, as I recall, those were kind of the two big things about Mosaic that uh, that got it so much popularity. Mm, interesting. So Spyglass started working on a web browser and it was it was a licensed version of Mosaic. What does that mean? Well, at the time, what we um, basically what it meant was we licensed the name and the right to use any code. Um, as it turns out, we ended up not using any of the code primarily because we wanted a cross-platform story from the beginning. And Mosaic in its day was a, a Unix browser and a, uh, a Mac version, um, which used a, a big um, application framework called Mac App. And it was a Windows version. And those three teams didn't share code. So it was... It was it was kind of a maintenance nightmare. It was just, because it was mostly a research project. So we more or less started from scratch and used the code as a reference, uh, but then also had the mosaic name and the official licensing relationship from the university. And you know, at the time, the the name and the uh, the university affiliation had some cachet to it, and, and that that was an asset. Ah. Uh. So, you know, these days, building a cross-platform application uh, typically means you build your iOS app, you build your Android app, you build your web app, and there's some wall of confusion between each of these teams building the individual app, and things are kind of a nightmare. So it's kind of understandable that you went in this direction, uh, even when the the cross-platform uh, strategy and it wasn't didn't have anything to do with mobile. Um, but what? So how how did you unify that application? What uh, what was what was that unification process like back in the day? Well, for us, it was basically trying to share as much code as we could, uh, written in C, and uh, so we had the portable section of our code that we would compile unchanged on what we thought of as all three platforms. Um, and then the uh, the UI part was rewritten for every platform. Uh, it's sort of like, well, I mean, it's a lot like mobile today if you have a language that you can compile for all three mobile phones on or something like that. Um, it, it's sort of like what would happen is if, if you're using Xamarin and you're doing all your core in C Sharp, or if you're writing your core code in C and you're compiling it for iOS and um, for Android and your and your UI on Android is in Java. I mean, it's it was that basic model. Mm -hmm. We were not using any of the like GUI abstraction frameworks of the day. Like you know, one of the ones that was popular at the time was XVT. Um, and this is way before things like QT or Qt, however it's pronounced. Okay, so how did the Mosaic or the Spyglass Mosaic version that you that you ended up building, how did that compare to the current browser that we have today? Oh, it was uh, it was fantastically different. Um, much much simpler. We didn't have uh, we didn't have JavaScript. So in that day, it really was just a text layout engine for rendering HTML. It was. Um, it was images. Uh, it was the ability to submit forms. Uh, it was a history and a back button. And this whole idea of JavaScript and the DOM. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those things didn't exist at all when we first started. Mm. Well, what kinds of engineering did you have to do to build a browser that we would take for advantage, take, take for granted today? What kinds of engineering that... What kinds of engineering would we take for granted, or the browser? Yeah, like like when so when you were yeah we, when you were engineering it, like what were the things that were difficult or challenging that today we would totally take for granted? Oh. Like we, we would just assume, oh, npm install whatever. <laughs> npm, <laughs> you're taking me back to a lot of nostalgia here. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, for one thing. Um, we didn't have version control that worked across platforms or over a network. So um, 
I mean, I'm talking about, it's not just that we didn't have Git, we didn't have Subversion. And before that, we didn't have CBS. <laughs> we had, uh, basically all we had was RCS, which is this really old thing that CBS is a descendant of. And so literally when we wanted to do uh, version control operations on a Mac or a Windows machine, we would shell into a, a Unix machine and type RCS commands to get the code in and out. Mm. And that's, I mean, and that's just source control. There's, there's, you know, not even a hint of things like package management or, mm. I mean, this was before the, the word open source existed. So, oh, sure. That's, that's a pretty big thing we take for granted, I guess. Absolutely. Um, so, okay. So you built the spyglass or, or I guess you were, you started coding it. a few, a few weeks after you started coding the spyglass mosaic browser, uh, Jim Clark came into town. That's so for right. those for those who don't know, who is Jim Clark? Uh, Jim Clark is a uh, Silicon Valley legend who uh, made a bundle of money on SGI, uh, Silicon Graphics, uh, which is you know a Unix workstation vendor from way back. Um, and. You know, you know, to be honest, I don't even know what made him want to jump into web browsers. But mm. what he did was he, he came into town and hired the, the stuff from the U of I that we didn't get, which is uh, we licensed the technology but didn't hire any of the developers. He went in and hired all the developers to create a startup and moved them all to the West Coast. Was Jim Clark a compelling leader in the way that we think of like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs? Well, those are lofty comparisons. Uh, Steve was, uh, I mean, those two guys had a technical brilliance to them, uh, especially Gates. Um, I don't think of Clark that way, but though I don't want to sell the man short. He was, he was obviously very well respected, very much admired, and had a tremendous track record. So, I mean, he's the kind of guy who could create Netscape. Um, but, you know, that came, my impression is, more from his leadership skills, his connections, his, his role as an executive, not so much for his role as either a uh, technical genius like Gates or a product visionary like Jobs. He, I don't mm. think of him as either of those two. Mm. So. Okay. So, so Jim Clark, as you said, eventually founded Netscape. Was was the Netscape business model the same that Spyglass had for the Spyglass Mosaic? Um, it was in some ways. I mean, we were certainly competitors. Uh, our approach was rather different. We went with uh, what we called an OEM business model, where we wanted to license browsers to other companies who were then going to sell those apps to, uh, to their customers. Mm. Uh, Netscape's model, and they were originally called Mosaic Communications until um, Spyglass on the U of I told them to stop using that name, and that's when the Netscape name came out and so forth. But they were uh. they were more about delivering a um, a browser directly to end users to use. Right. Okay. So you had this OEM model. Um... Were, were, were there enough corporations who would want your browser, who would want to license a browser? Well, there were at first, and we certainly thought that would stay that way. There, we, uh, I mean, if Spyglass was not uh, as successful as they would like, it would be because they underestimated the degree to which all of this would consolidate. And, you know, so... I think I, I've said in various places, I don't know where, but um, at, at one point we had 120 companies licensing our browser and putting their name on it, adding features or whatever, and using it and, and distributing their own web browser. Yeah, and, and you wrote in, in this blog post that I read, you said these 20, 120 companies or so, they licensed Spyglass Mosaic and, and they bundled it into products like ATMs, operating systems, set-top boxes, so this is so such a foreign concept to me. Obviously, it was a reality, but why, like, why did such a broad variety of things need access to uh, their own third-party browser, like ATMs and 
set-top boxes. Why do these things need a browser? Well, the I mean, so for example, the ATMs they wanted it because it was just a different way for them to build their ATM software. ATMs had already been building software. Probably what happened is that some developers at Citibank's team, when they were building their ATM, said, hey, this web thing looks like another way for us to try and do this. But fundamentally, do you want your ATM to be able to surf um, (laughs) any website? No, you don't. So that was not that issue. Uh, However, like the set-top boxes, um, there were all kinds of people in 1995, who thought that TVs were going to be the primary way that people access the web. And uh, those people were were buying browsers. (sighs) Lots of them. I see. So were these companies, like, they bought the browser and then they just, like, experimented with it and then they were paying you to license it while they were experimenting? Or did products actually, like, roll out using a browser in a weird way that would, like, seem totally foreign today? Oh, products rolled out. Um, oh, okay. So, for example, like, one of our licensees was uh, the was Apple, and when they created what's called the Pippin. <laughs> Anybody remember the Pippin? Uh, Pippin was a set-top box. Uh, basically, it was a Mac. I mean, it, it, it was the early, early precursor, precursor to Apple TV. And um, so, and Pippin had a web browser in it, just, you know, just like an iPhone has now. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. So, so around this time, so you're working on Spyglass Mosaic and Netscape and Jim Clark start competing with you. Tell me what it was like to be competing with Netscape around that time. Um, it was, it was certainly um, interesting. And I, and there again, I was young when I when I went through this, and so mostly for me, this was just a tremendous learning experience more than it was an opportunity for me to say, "Oh, look at all the great wise decisions I made back then." <laughs> um, but we we were certainly being outspent was one uh, one interesting thing, um, and in terms of um, you know in terms of press and attention it, it's it was true then and it's still true today that uh, if you're Jim Clark in Silicon Valley you can get more attention um, and so he played this right from day one um, he uh, when he bought I should say bought <laughs> when he hired the NCSA team uh, two of the main guys he got were Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina mm. and um Eric Bina is just uh, a wizard uh, of a programmer. You stick him in uh, a dark room and you make sure that there's room under the door to slide pizzas in. <laughs> and he, he cranks out brilliant stuff. Um, and so almost immediately, as far as I understand it, they printed business cards for Eric Bina that said unsung hero because um, he was... <laughs> He didn't get a lot of attention. Meanwhile, Mark Andreessen ended up on the cover of Time Magazine. Yeah, was Mark Andreessen kind of a product manager? I don't really know what Mark's hands-on role was. Um, I mean, it's it's really strange to think of Mark um, in that day compared to the Mark Andreessen we, we know today, who has been so, so successful as a businessman and venture capitalist. Um he, you know, Mark wasn't much older than I was. And so I, I suspect he looks back on those days and thinks about how young he was compared to he, how he is now, just like I do. Um, he was a developer. Um, he wrote code for the Unix version of Mosaic at NCSA. I don't know if he wrote code when they went to Netscape or not. Uh, my impression was always that he was more in a... Uh, in a, an outward facing role as opposed to a heads down role. Uh, mm. uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't tell you what Mark did day to day. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. So eventually Netscape got ahead of Spyglass in terms of features. What were the features that Netscape was rolling out that uh, allowed them to, to compete successfully against Spyglass? Well, hmm. certainly, um, they got ahead of us pretty quickly on um, 
adding things to HTML. I'm trying to think this through. You know, it by 90, let me think. So we started this in 94. I believe Netscape was founded in late 94. The next several months were sort of a race to the NASDAQ because everybody started filing for IPO and everybody wanted to get onto the NASDAQ. Uh, our IPO happened in 95. What I don't remember the timing of is that somewhere in there, our customers mostly started telling us that they just wanted our browser to render things the way Netscape did, regardless of what the standard said. <laughs> And this was at a time when we had started to become involved in the standardization efforts. I was the chair of the HTML working group within the ITF at one point. Uh, we, were, we were at the first three W3C web conferences, and I got to meet Tim Berners-Lee, who's now a, you know, a legend and so forth. And, uh, so we were trying to be involved in the standards efforts, even as... In the practical sense, everybody really just wanted our browser to be Netscape compatible. <laughs> so, is this, is this the symptom of Jim Clark's influence? Um, I'd say that has to be part of it, uh, but it's also. I mean, I don't say that nefariously. Just sure. like you know, he, like you said, he had the tendrils and the and the influence and. And you know if if it's a you know if it's a if it's a race to shape public opinion and public perception, uh, then it sounds like Jim Clark was a was a good horse to have in that race. Yeah, I, I would say that's certainly true. Uh, one of the other things, though, that I can't really recall the timing of is, I mean, at one point I believe Netscape came out with their browser at forty bucks. And, you know, we're not selling a, a product directly to com- consumers. We're selling it to companies. Our pricing ranged from 55 cents in very high volumes up to like eight bucks. And then some company would charge a markup on top of that. Is that like, so it's like 55 cents flat per user? Yeah. yeah. Um, but that was, that was to companies that made commitments in the millions of users to us. So, mm. um, but at some point, Netscape stopped charging 40 bucks for their browser, and they just started releasing it for free. And, mm. I mean, this was one of the very early experiments in using free software to gain, uh, to gain market share. Uh, mm. And when I say free software, yeah, you know, I mean no cost, because the, the code did not become open source until later. Yeah. But that had to yeah. contribute some to the... Um, you know, what that did is it created this demand for us to create a browser that worked like theirs because people would want to embed a browser, but the source code for what is now Mozilla wasn't out there. And so if you want to embed a browser, you have to buy something. And so they would come to us and they would say, well, hey, this is great. But this one so thing, did, it doesn't work just like Netscape. So. Was, was the market bifurcating into, into embed, like, where you had, where Spyglass had the embedded browser market and Netscape had the consumer browser market, or was it not that clearly defined? It was not that clearly defined. Nothing in that day was that clearly understood. <laughs> <laughs> it was just everybody running around like crazy trying to close mm-hmm. business deals. And you set out to close one kind of business deal and you stumble across an opportunity that's totally different and you, and you chase that instead. Well, and speaking of those kind of deals, when did Spyglass decide to make a deal with Microsoft? Um, let's see. When did they decide? <laughs> the timing of that, I'm having trouble remembering exactly, too. But it was, I'll say it this way, it was very early on. Um, I believe we were in discussions about that in uh, at points in 94, deal closed in 95, right around the same time as our IPO, if I remember correctly. Um, mm. All the negotiation was well above my pay grade. <sighs> um, I was just the developer. Um, and so when the when the deal was getting close, I was the developer sent out to Redmond to coordinate with their team. Um, and this was, this was all happening in the context of Windows 95. So, like, so this was a this was around the time where Microsoft was becoming a force to really be reckoned with. Yes, yes. Microsoft was. I mean, they were certainly quite successful before Windows ninety five, but that 
that was the OS that really took off for them. Yeah, and I, I, in your blog post, you you gave some context into what it was like that experience where you you visited Microsoft and worked some during that integration process. And I thought you had some very interesting points on uh, how intense the the work environment sounded. Uh, what was it like? What was it like? Uh, visiting Microsoft during that time? Certainly it was, it it felt crazy to me at the time. Um, (laughs) Because, I mean, I I was back in Champaign working some, you know, some crazy hours myself sometimes. But to go into an environment, you know, on my first trip to Redmond to work with the the Chicago team, uh, Chicago was the code name for Win95, uh, my my first trip to to work with them, it, just the the intensity was just everywhere. And I, you know, I think I said in one of my blog posts, it was just funny how people would work. Dinner would be served in the cafeteria. They'd go down and grab a bite. They'd come back and they'd work until you know all hours of the night. Um, this was this was during the era when everybody said if you joined Microsoft and could survive for five years, you'd be a millionaire. And, uh, you know, that would, you know, that's just the way Microsoft was in that day. A lot of intensity, a lot of stuff going on. People inside Microsoft were really, really excited about Win95. And Mm. and they should have been. It was a very successful product. So this was a, was it like a pressure cooker or was it like people were working their tails off because they were, like genuinely impassioned about the company or like, I'm really curious what the, what the internal culture was like. I never got the impression that it was like, you know, a sweatshop or that, you know, it was guys on the bottom of the boat being whipped while they ri- while they pull the oars. <laughs> you know, I always got the impression that these people were just, um, were just really psyched about what they were doing. Hmm. Interesting, because I've worked I've worked at Amazon and at Amazon it was a little of each. Uh, no, no sure. offense to to people working at Amazon, but uh, certainly there's a, there's a little ore rowing, but there's also plenty of, of genuine um, genuine excitement. Engineers love automation, and Wealthfront automates your investing. As a software engineer, there are certain processes that you want to execute no matter what, like integration tests during a build. You wouldn't execute integration tests manually. You would use a continuous integration tool like CodeShip or Jenkins to automate your integration tests. Wealthfront is a tool to automate investing. Just like a continuous integration tool runs your tests automatically, Wealthfront can reinvest your dividends automatically and perform tax loss harvesting automatically. To get your first $15,000 managed by Wealthfront for free, go to Wealthfront.com slash SE Daily and get started with Wealthfront's layer of automation on top of your portfolio. Wealthfront.com slash SE Daily. Check it out. It would support Software Engineering Daily and you will get $15,000 managed for free if you sign up. Automate your investing. Get back to the things that you can't automate, like writing code. When did it start turning into a real browser war between Microsoft and Netscape? Well, I mean, that would be right around, let's see. I mean, I always think of, IE4 as the turning point. I mean, so we licensed them um, the original browser, and they and they went on to do IE2 and 3 that were all you know very much based on our code. But somewhere in there, I hope I'm getting this right, or, or somebody's going to call in here and correct me, but. <laughs> Somewhere in there, my recollection is that JavaScript made it into the browser at Netscape first. Mm. And and originally, it was just simple stuff. I mean, it was like, hey, I want to attach a little JavaScript snippet to this form control so it can do stuff. And then it turned into... um, During the IE4 and Netscape 4 product cycle... Uh, it turned into the DOM. 
It turned into this, this big platform where you could write entire programs um, that run inside your browser. And people started mm -hmm. talking about the browser as an application delivery platform instead of as a hypertext document viewer. Right. So uh, as things were heating up competitively, I mean, people, you know, I, I hear this narrative that Microsoft did stuff that was like really nefarious and competitive. And uh, I, I, you know, I guess I'm maybe I'm just not well versed on this topic, but did Microsoft ever actually do anything that was anti-competitive? Well, I mean, certainly, certainly the DOJ thought so. <laughs> it's hard to say. I, I mean, I mean, DOJ pretty bad at software today. Presumably, much worse at software back then, right? Or, or is that a naive way of, of thinking about it? Were they were they more sophisticated than I'm giving them credit for? It's certainly not. Um, <laughs> my, you know, there was a, a point being made there that that Microsoft including the browser in their um, in their OS was anti-competitive. I never quite understood that. Uh, certainly, I didn't see it that way. It seemed to me that <laughs> it was a natural thing to stick in an OS. And if anybody should have sued them for being anti-competitive, it should have been Spyglass. Because, I mean, we had 119 other licensees and Microsoft destroyed them all. So... Um, I mean, our, our Spyglass as a business had to, had to make a make a major pivot simply because of one of the customers we sold to. Um, so, but you know, were we going to sue them for that? No, I, I, maybe it got discussed at the executive level, but I never heard about it. So, what what was it that happened? Was it was this essentially uh, Jim Clark like phoning up phoning up Congress and? or the Department of Justice and saying, look, you guys got to look into this thing or what exactly occurred? I don't actually know how the DOJ thing got going. I really don't. Um, and and I hesitate to, to draw on my vague recollections or speculation <laughs> uh, after the fact. My recollection, though, is that most of the anti-competitive Big Bad Microsoft stuff happened after I left Spyglass. And it, it well, it it happened. I mean, I presume that um, you know Netscape felt like they were wronged, um, certainly, um, because I mean another thing I might have said in my blog and I don't recall was that you know like I said IE four felt like the turning point, and when I came to understand that that uh, Microsoft had a thousand people working on IE four. That was kind of the moment when I realized that not only was Spyglass business not viable, uh, <laughs> Netscape, Netscape was doomed too. I mean, there was really only one outcome that could come out of that kind of resource disparity. So it's uh, somewhere along the way there um, as Spyglass and its business waned and started to pivot, I left in 19, early 1997. Hmm. And I don't remember the timing of, of all the anti-competitive stuff, but I, my recollection is that it happened after that, and I wasn't paying that much attention. Well, okay, you do mention, you said that, but okay, it, it, in you also said in your blog post, though, like, of these 120 companies that licensed Spyglass Mosaic so that they can bundle it into their product, there were there were all these companies, you said like 119 of them the the remaining one being actually Microsoft, you know, because you licensed spot to, to clarify, you licensed Spyglass to Microsoft so that they could use it to. I guess they were using it as a reference, or either they were they were implementing it or something. Uh, um, but you said that these 119 companies were all embittered by the fact that you were working with uh, Microsoft because they were being squashed by Microsoft. Um, so, but but maybe maybe Microsoft was actually just squashing them with superior products rather than like anti-competitive practices. Well, I mean, where's the line between anti-competitive and just being big? I mean, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> somewhere during that time frame was what was the day that Microsoft had ninety to ninety-five percent market share on the desktop, and 
Absolutely. When you stick a browser in your OS and you have 95% market share on the desktop, anybody else trying to sell a browser probably isn't going to be very successful. And is that mm. is that anti-competitive or is that just big? I don't know. Uh, I mean, that's a question for lawyers and I've always preferred to stay away from it. But mm. um, I do know that regardless of law, I do know how that makes people feel. <laughs> and I certainly heard the gripes from you know, from our other 119 licensees and they mm. felt bad and they took some of it out on us and they, they would, you know, they would contact us and say, why would you sell to Microsoft? And we would say, do you have any idea how much they paid us? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> why would we not sell to Microsoft? If we didn't, someone else would. I mean, you, you talk them through it and it doesn't change the fact that they feel bad because they're going to lose. So the deal with Microsoft was it that they were embedding Spyglass Mosaic as like IE 1.0 or was it they got to see the code and use it as a reference implementation? What exactly was it? Uh, the deal was um, was licensing. It was of the technology and the name and the affiliation with U of I. And they actually did use the Spyglass code. Mm. Uh, now... I mean, I don't remember. We know for a fact that IE2 and 3 um, were mostly Spyglass code, and IE4 had some Spyglass code in it. I mean, years later, I suspect it's gone. I mean, I don't know how long that lasted, but they definitely shipped our code. Um, and for for quite a while, the, uh, uh, the About box of Internet Explorer had um, credits to both Spyglass and the University of Illinois, um, as uh, as licensing sources, so mm, interesting. So, you know, there are some modern internet businesses that are characterized as land grab businesses. Like if you look at Uber versus Lyft, uh, people talk as if this is a winner take all market. Um, uh, I think there there have been other other cases of this, um, and I you know as a personal perspective, I think sometimes these uh, land grab businesses are actually not as much of a land grab business as people frame them but and then uh but the companies get convinced it's a land grab business and then they position them such that it is a land grab business and they see this narrow point of view um was that the case with the browser wars like did the war for internet browser dominance get uh get perturbed by the fact that it was framed as a land grab business like is there an alternate future where, you know, Spyglass and uh, Internet Explorer and uh, Mo- and uh, uh, Netscape all exist harmoniously and perform different functions, or was this truly a land grab business? Hey, that's a really good question. I mean, we certainly didn't think of it in those terms back then, or I didn't. I mean, you're asking questions about things I wish I understood at the time. Um, <laughs> I would talk to, uh, you know, the the execs who did the deal with Microsoft and the execs who, who would talk to Jim Clark, you know, competitively. And um, I, I'm just the guy who's trying to make sure that I'm not double freeing a pointer in C. So uh, I didn't really have any business sense. And um, so if there were conversations going on where people were speaking of this as a land grab, I certainly wasn't privy to them. But I don't think that's the way anybody <laughs> thought of it. I think people would thought of it as um, as just this big new thing that everybody's trying to figure out where it's going to go. Mm. And my initial reaction to the attempt, any attempt to characterize it as a land grab, is that. I don't think anybody at the time knew what the land was. I mean, (laughs) what would we grab? (laughs) Are we grabbing document viewing? Are we grabbing, um, are we grabbing this app platform notion? Because, you know, at the time, I mean, we had everything from, you know, obviously the people who saw this as a way to build apps, um, a, a new delivery mechanism for applications, those people kind of ended up winning. I mean, that's just, that's what browsers became. But at the time, you know, we had the the high-end document crowd wanting to know, well, why isn't HTML more like SGML? Why can't we do DTDs and 
high-end document referencing. And, and to some extent, that view of the browser was consistent with Tim Berners-Lee's original vision for the web. I mean, it was hypertext. Yeah. So there were a lot of angles that didn't really become big, but they were big at the time. Yeah. So there's been a lot of media coverage and storytelling around the browser wars. I read one book uh, called The New New Thing by Michael Lewis. There's a number of other books and topics uh, around this. Um, I recognize that you're the guy that was trying to free a double pointer, but um, you know you were involved firsthand. So from your perspective, what what did the media get wrong about the browser wars and what, what continues to get misunderstood or mistold? Um, well, if, you know, if I, that's interesting. Um, certainly I think that, um, the media shined a light on things that were interesting from a media perspective. And there were other things that maybe should have had a light shined on it that didn't get as much. And so, for example, I mean, if, if I were, uh, if I wanted to focus on sour grapes, I would, uh, I would say, man, I, I wish the spyglass role as the arms dealer in this war were, were more well known, but you know, th- th- the fact is uh, I learned a lot. Um, I came out of it with a fairly decent sized pile of money. I'm not, I have no regrets. Um, but there were, you know, guys like, um, um, guys like Dave Thompson, um, Dave T was one of the original NCSA guys. Um, and he was, you know, at one point along the way, somebody, I forget who did an article on Dave T because they realized, you know, this guy was like, he was there. He was, he was an important part of this, and he didn't get any press. And so they wrote some stuff on him, and I felt good about that because, you know, it was um, it was a little bit of unsung hero stuff going on with Dave Thompson. Mm. Um, you know, Eric Bina still, you know, um, to me, the, uh, the tale of the other guy on Unix Mosaic who didn't end up on, <laughs> on the cover of Time Magazine, uh, that's interesting stuff. I always, I always liked hearing more about Eric Bina, but um, the press liked writing more about uh, Jim Clark. Um, and Jim would steer more of the press towards Mark Andreessen, or at least that would be my understanding. And so, um, you know, it's, it's the press. It, it's, yeah. it's just the way it is. And I don't... I don't remember a lot of stuff coming out of the press that was just wrong, but mm. it was it was a little bit more of a distant view, and it was it was a a little bit more of a storytelling view. So, yeah, I mean, I I sometimes feel that uh, these days the the storytelling view, like that's that that's one of the, my motivations with software engineering daily is uh, you know I read these these tech journalism. Uh, sites and it's always this like acerbic often cynical um you know poor poor technical understanding of what's going on uh and it just like it it makes me like want to bring more clarity to the situation sometimes so anyway let's let's start wrapping up i guess by talking about the present what what are you working on lately that that gets you excited (laughs) uh well i mean I, uh, as I said, I left Spyglass in 97 and founded my own company and, and actually I'm still running it. So uh, we've been in business for about 19 years and we've done a whole bunch of different things along the way. Um, currently, uh, we're like everybody else, we're, we're focused on mobile and uh, we have this product where we do data synchronization of uh, data on your mobile device to data on the back end of the, of the cloud. And that's been, that's been fun because there's some interesting technical challenges there as well as some, uh, uh, some definite business opportunities. And so that's, that's always been a good fit for us. Um, I've, uh, you know, I've been personally taking an interest in, um, how shall I describe them? Languages that, um, Languages like F Sharp and Rust, uh, languages, functional programming. I've taken an interest in um, 
things that don't necessarily get a lot of mainstream attention in the commercial world. Um, mm. and, uh, and, 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 Part of my interest there is just because I enjoy geeky things. <laughs> and part of my interest is also wondering, you know, how does one predict which of those things become mainstream over time? And, you know, what would it take for mm. one of them to go mainstream? Things like that. So, Well, geeky seems to be the bellwether for what seems to be going mainstream these days. Um, I, maybe not universally true, but like, and certainly in terms of functional programming, I mean, I feel like even just in the past five or six months since we've started doing software engineering daily, uh, the interest in functional programming languages has, has been hockey sticking. Um, what, why do you think that is like, why are, is there some pleasurable set of features that functional programming provides? I mean, I always hear things like immutability. Um, but is, are, are, are there any nuances about, about functional programming that, uh, you would be able to, to illuminate, given your um, your experience in the field, well, I mean, nuances. I sort of want to answer your question in two ways, and so I, I so I just will. <laughs> one of the one of the ways is that all of this talk about immutability and so forth, all this talk aside, one of the things that I consistently hear about people who poke their nose into functional programming is that they whether they end up being able to use it in their job or not, they end up a better programmer. I, I just always hear that. Whether it's F Sharp or Haskell or whatever, um, it, it's one of those programming disciplines that changes you. And I think that is part of its popularity. I, I think it appeals to a, a set of people who... Um, regardless of what they're working on, even if they're just sitting in a, in a job working for a bank being told to fix stupid COBOL bugs, <laughs> I mean, regardless of how boring their job is, there's a desire for them to just get better. And I, yeah. I, I think a lot of functional programming people fit that profile and they find out that, hey, when I spent a bunch of time in Haskell, I became a better Java programmer, even though I don't like Java as much. <laughs> You know, things like that. I, I think that's that's part of the dynamic. And that's sort of a social answer, not a technical answer. Um, but the, the other thing I would say as a caution or almost is, is that um, by definition, I mean, you and I are on a podcast right now, which means by definition, we are distinct from mainstream. <laughs> I mean, there's... The real notion of mainstream um, is programmers who don't even get to think about doing functional programming during the day. <laughs> I mean, most programming is still done in the most boring, predictable languages that, that companies can find. <laughs> and so when I, you know, when I think of mainstream, I'm usually thinking of it as stages of mainstream. There's... You know, there's one stage where people get really interested in it, but there's there's a later stage, maybe it's three stages later, where Procter and Gamble is using functional programming. <laughs> and that's that's a very different stage. And I, I find it interesting to think about how does something get to that stage? And, I, and the other thing I, have, I find it interesting to think about is that by the time Ford Motor Company is using technologies as cool as, say, Elixir, uh, we won't be because it will be boring by then. Mm. <laughs> you know, we're, the early adopters are always so far ahead of the, uh, of the, the mainstream users that uh, you know, I, don't, I don't know what we'll be interested in by the time that um, functional programming is boring, but it'll be something else. Well, that seems like a good place to close off Eric, thanks so much for coming on to Software Engineering Daily. This is a super interesting conversation. I, I appreciate you uh, going back in time to retell a story that I'm sure you've told a thousand times, but uh, it was very new and fresh to me. So I, I really appreciate it. Very good. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed, uh, I've enjoyed our time talking. Mm -hmm.